Aaron Dykes here for TrueStreamMedia.com and I continue to encounter people who just think that science is here to give us little Christmas gifts all the time and that any technological developments are automatically for our benefit. Well, I'm here to warn you otherwise because those in power are always seeking greater power and many of their developments have been deliberately crafted to centralize that power and take it away from individuals. And there's a lot of information that goes into that, but someone like the Rockefeller Foundation is a good example of how they fund scientific research to pursue their own individual aims. And there's been lots of books in the 20th century warning about the tendency of science, of technology, to centralize power. And we're going to get to one of the most drastic in just a moment. But one of them is The Technological Society by Jacques Ellul, the French author. He warns about the centralization of power, about the power of brainwashing, the power of propaganda, the technological collaboration of many governments across the world, and a whole lot more. You've got Edward Bernays in his seminal book, Propaganda, who explains how experts and scientists and technocrats can steer society that he considers to be animalistic and dumbed down through repetition and basically sales pitches and the like, and that basically you don't live in the world you think you do. Aldous Huxley's big warning book, Brave New World, but also important, his nonfiction follow-up, Brave New World Revisited, but I continue to remain interested in Bertrand Russell, The Impact of Science on Society, what I regard as one of the most impactful books of the 20th century. And in 1952, he wrote this in that post-World War II era, warning about, obviously what the title indicates, how much science is going to impact society. In other words, specifically, how much power is going to be changed due to the developments. And we've read other passages before from here, but take first the question of food and population, he says on page 38. At present, the population of the globe is increasing at a rate of about 20 millions per year. Most of this increase is Russia and Southeast Asia. The population of Western Europe and the United States is ne nearly stationary. Meanwhile, the food supply of the world as a whole threatens to diminish as a result of unwise, unwise methods of cultivation and the destruction of forests. This is an explosive situation. Left to itself, it must lead to food shortage and thence a world war. Technique, however, makes other issues possible. Vital statistics in the West are dominated by medicine and birth control. The one diminishes the deaths, the other the births. The result is the average age in the West increases. There's a small percentage of young people and a large percentage of old people. Some consider the that this must have unfortunate results, but speaking as an old person, I'm not so sure. The danger of a world food, of a short, the danger of a shortage of world food may be averted for a time by improvements in the technique of agriculture. But if population continues to increase at the present rate, such improvements cannot long suffice. There will be then two groups, one poor with increasing population, the other rich with the stationary population. Such a situation can hardly fail to lead to world war. If there's not to be an endless succession of wars, population will have to become stationary throughout the world. This will probably have to be done in many countries as a result of governmental measures. So you see right away where they're concerned with population, they're concerned with food production. He regurgitates a lot of the Malthusian claims from Sir Thomas Malthus, one of the forefathers of eugenics and directly of eugenics claims, and a lot of the specific pursuits of the Rockefeller Foundation in the 20th century. He goes on to say, this will require an extension of scientific technique into very intimate matters. In other words, science is going to be used to intrude into your very bedroom, into your very body, into your very life. There are, however, two other possibilities. War may become so destructive that at any rate for a time there's no danger of overpopulation, or the scientific nations may be defeated as anarchy may destroy scientific technique. Biology is likely to affect human life through the study of heredity, and without science, men have changed domestic animals and plants enormously in advantageous ways. It may be assumed that there will change them much more and much more quickly by bringing the science of genetics to bear. Perhaps it may become possible artificially to induce desirable mutations in genes. So they're going to change human bodies, animals, plants. They're doing that now. 
Hitherto, the only mutations that could be artificially caused are neutral or harmful. In any case, it's pretty certain scientific technique will very soon affect great improvements in the animals and plants that are useful to man. When such methods of modifying the congenital characteristics of animals and plants have been pursued long enough to make their success obvious, it's probable there will be a powerful movement for applying scientific methods to human propagation. So first they're going to genetically engineer the food, which they're obviously now doing. Then they will begin to genetically engineer humans to regard their reproduction, their propagation. There would be, at first, strong religious and emotional obstacles to the adoption of a policy, but say Russia were able to overcome these obstacles and breed a race stronger, more intelligent, more resistant to disease than any race of men has hitherto existed. And suppose other nations perceived that unless they followed suit, they'd be defeated in war and other nations would voluntarily forego their prejudices and at, or after defeat be compelled to forego them and scientific technique however beastly it's bound to spread if it's useful in war until men decide they have had enough of war and will henceforth live in peace i.e. under a world government which he details uh, just a few pages before as the day does seem to be at hand scientific breeding of humans must be expected to come about He'll discuss this in a later chapter, and I'll jump ahead to some of the key quotes from later in that chapter where he says uh, he discusses a hypothetical Nazi-type regime and how they may develop a system, one may surmise, will some, that will run something like this. Except possibly in the governing aristocracy, all but 5% of the males and 30% of the females will be sterilized, which they've already done to people and they've established laws to do so. The 30% of females will be expected or compelled to spend the years from 18 to 40 in reproduction in order to secure adequate cannon fodder. As a rule, artificial insemination will be preferred to natural methods. The unsterilized, if they desire the pleasure of love, will usually have to seek them with the sterilized partners. And in other quotes, he also adds that sires will be chosen for various qualities, some for muscle, others for brains. All will have to be healthy, and unless they're to be the fathers of oligarchs, they will have to be of submissive and docile disposition. Children will be taken from their mothers and reared by professional nurses, and Bertrand Russell also wrote, gradually by selective breeding, the congenital differences between ruler and ruled will increase until they become almost different species. And so you see in that summation here, just some of the possibilities for the rulers to use science and technology to have even greater control over you. The possibility of your being bred to be submissive and docile unless you're an oligarch or from an oligarch. The idea that women, everyone will be sterilized except those who've been choose to breed. So you've got breeders and everyone else is basically sterilized and can love for the sake of love, but not for the sake of having their own families, and that children will be ruled basically by the state through professional nurses. And so don't tell me that science can only be used for our advantage. And furthermore, if they're going to genetically engineer food crops like they're now doing through science, but they want to control the population and they're worried about it exploding, as you saw in these quotes over here, do you really think they wouldn't consider putting sterilization agents into those plants? Do you really think those plants are automatically there for your benefit? There have been all kinds of life-changing consequences associated with the consumption of genetically modified foods. Many, many dangers raised by true critics, but totally ignored by the system, which is, a, which is interested in advancing those crops and for what purpose? To improve your life or to control it? To help poor people lead better lives or to keep them from reproducing and being a part of this earth? Whose future is it going to be and what will technology and science be used for? Obviously, it could be used for good. It could be a double-edged sword. But who is in control of it? And why do you automatically trust it? Signing off for TrueStreamMedia.com, I'm Aaron Dykes.